What's up, everybody? This is the Ex Nihilo Podcast. Glad you guys are jumping in with me. Hey, today we are talking about the eight health hacks, eight simple health hacks that will put you in a perfect position to begin a life of long-term health. So, you know, I think it's important for all of us, for those of you that are, you know, Christians, faith-based, it's important to figure out how to reconcile these two worlds, right? And, you know, our world, our society, our culture doesn't do a great job at this. Like I mentioned before, Christians are always almost last to the party. We're always like 20 years behind culture. And when it comes to health, we are so far behind. We are in the 70s and 80s. We are drinking Sanka. We are on carnation powdered milk. We are on, um, you know, Jane Fonda, Slim Fast Diet, sort of Atkins style stuff. We are so far behind. And so for this podcast, I want for us to sort of catch up. I want us to catch up in our worldview, catch up in our thought process, catch up on what is actually healthy and what works for us, right? And so I'm going to give you eight things I think will jumpstart your your journey towards um, not only good health, but God-honoring health. I want that combination to be at the forefront for you. I want you to be able to think about your life, um, your health, and your spirituality as sort of this, sort of this combination. All of these things flow together. So... Let's talk solutions for a moment. So eight simple health hacks that will put you in perfect position to begin a life of long-term health, okay? So without any other information, I do think that these eight simple tips will help you feeling, help you begin to feel better. You'll be feeling better. You'll be performing better. You'll be acting better. You'll be playing better. You'll be all of the things, okay? That's the goal. Remember, there are three uh, big pillars for the Ex Nihilo lifestyle that I want for you. The first is well-being. I want you to feel good. You know, I'm convinced that most people have never felt optimal in their entire lives. They've never, what I mean by that is they've never felt as good as they possibly could um, living on planet Earth. It is possible that they can unlock a higher level of well-being in their brains and in their bodies and their spirits if they just tweak some of the things they're eating. It's hard for people to really reconcile, but the things you're putting in your body actually do affect your 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 performance, your thought process, how you're feeling, how you talk to people. You have neurotransmitters, you have things like dopamine and serotonin that are affected with how you eat and digest food. It's it's weird for people to think. I know Christians, again, we're so dualistic, we're so spirit oriented, and we forget that uh, the mind and spirit are actually connected to the body. So I, I think well-being is going to be affected as you begin to eat these things. That's the first thing. Second pillar is longevity. Uh, I want you to be around as long as possible. Remember, you know, we're put on earth, Matthew 28, to go forth and make disciples. That's the mission. Every Christian has a standing order from God to make disciples of many nations. I want you to be able to do that as long as possible. Not only that, I want you to be able to enjoy the things that God has put in your life as long as possible. So family, uh, that's a wife or a husband, uh, brother, sister, mother, father, um, children. If you've got sons and daughters, I want you to be around for them as long as possible. Friends, God said in the beginning, you know, he creates all things. He creates human beings, man and woman, and he says it's not good for man to be alone, right? That's, that's why men and women are sort of created to be together. I do think that community is a part of our created order. I want you to be around to enjoy those you care about. Uh, Longevity is important. And so if you want to do the mission God has given you, if you want to enjoy the things that God has given you, it's important for you to understand that what you eat, what you ingest, and how you live will affect how long you live. Okay? Plain and simple. Why put yourself in position to uh, not be here longer? I, I have family and friends myself, and I'm sure you do too, that have died or have gotten sick unnecessarily because of things they've actually done to themselves. Is you don't people don't just die for things that they don't have any control over. Um, people actually do die as a result of things that they cause, mainly chronic disease, metabolic syndrome, right? These things like diabetes, heart attack, uh, asthma, stroke. Alzheimer's, dementia, hypertension, you name it. These are all things um, that we could potentially be affecting with our diet and lifestyle choices, okay? Well-being, longevity, and the third pillar is performance. Not only do I want you to be here on planet Earth, I want you to perform well. Like I said, most of us have no clue what it's like to live optimal. I think that if you do these eight things, your performance is gonna go to the next level. If you've been eating the standard American diet, Acronym for that is SAD because it's SAD. 
standard American diet, which is filled with Ritz crackers and hamburger buns and uh, oatmeal in the morning filled with phylates and all these toxins and brown sugar in your oatmeal and maybe the occasional protein shake and a high sugar smoothie after your workout and dessert four nights a week, there's no way you feel good. I guarantee it. And if you don't, if you think, oh, I feel great, it's because you've never felt better. You've always eaten this way. If you come off some of the junk you've been eating, I promise you, you will, you will take your brain power and your performance to a new level. I want that for you. I want you to have the three p- pillars of what ex nihilo way of life is, well-being, longevity, performance, and if you get the bonus of looking and feeling good, looking good, great. If it helps you connect better with Jesus, which I know it will, that's even better, okay? Without further ado, let's get into these eight simple health hacks, okay? First thing, eat food as close to the way God made them as possible. Here's the deal. Modern manufacturing, farming, production practices have made food more about sales and more and less about nutrition. It's more about profit and less about how it affects you and how it makes you feel good, perform good, and, and experience life, live a long time, okay? Now, if you think about the Bible, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, they talk about how God originally made everything great, right? It wasn't until sin entered the world that creation was broken and that it would produce sort of quote-unquote thorns and thistles, as the scriptures say, um, sort of fighting back, the the creation sort of fights back against humanity as as we try to harvest from its resources. So as we go to get the fruits and vegetables and raise the livestock to produce the nourishing uh, foods and and vegetables and and fruits and all these things to drink that we need, uh, the world sort of fights back against us. All of us, many of us have allergies. These plants dislike us at, to such a high degree as a result of sin in chapter three um, that we even are allergic to even standing and breathing in the substances that the that the that the plants produce that is not normal Adam and Eve were not walking around the garden of Eden sneezing because of the rose bushes and sneezing because of the grain bushes or because of the grain fields they weren't doing that that is a result of fall. That is a result of the thorns and thistles. That is a result of you and I, sin, rebelling against God. And as a result, we're at war with creation. We're at war with God. We're at war with one another and ourselves, to be quite honest. So to combat this struggle, humanity has resulted to sort of modern practices to help the pocketbook of large companies, but hurt the health of our consumers. I mean, vegetables are sprayed with harmful pesticides. We've talked about glyphosate in the past. Uh, killing nutritional content, destroying soil quality. There's only a few essential nutrients in our current soil around the United States that most of our crops are produced in. Um, and so we're lacking so much, so much of that high quality uh, micronutrient that we require for our bodies to function. As a result, these companies have been modifying foods so that they're more easily produced, but actually harm our bodies, including our gut biome, including our blood, including just our entire way of life. Things like inflammation are increasing in our bodies. And inflammation, as I've said before, is the number one precursor to every major modern Western disease. It's a bell we have to keep ringing because we keep eating foods that are harming us. Things like industrial meat farms, they pump livestock full of antibiotics and hormones and wreck our gut bacteria, harm our hormones. And on top of that, animals are fed suspect foods that cause them to store toxins in their fat. Remember, we've talked about this on uh, episode eight, but when you eat an animal that is uh, industrially raised, you are they are storing the toxins of the GMO corn, the GMO grain, and even the city garbage that they ingest. I'm not kidding you. If you go to Central California, you might accidentally see some cows eating city garbage, um, and they're going to store those toxins in their fat. And when you go get a ribeye steak from a restaurant, like an Applebee's or something like that, or you you go um, buy some a gallon of milk from the store from an industrial raised cow, you are drinking literally those toxins, uh, and that's taxing your liver. It's making you fat. And what they do is they go on the back end and try to homogenize the milk, quote unquote, clean the milk, because they know that you know that animal was really unhealthy and it's probably primed and for a lot of disease. All I have to say, you aren't what you you aren't what you eat. You are what your food eats, and that's not all, guys. Big agriculture. If you think, oh, I'll just avoid meat, I'll avoid dairy, and I'll eat vegetables, and I'll eat uh, a vegan or vegetarian. <clears throat> 
That's not all. Big agriculture uh, also produces much of the world's canola, soybean, and vegetable oil. By the way, canola oil is rapeseed oil um, out of Canada. That's where it gets its name, canola oil, Canada oil. Um, Obviously, marketing reasons. You wouldn't want to call it rapeseed oil. It's not necessarily exciting to buy. But canola, soybean, and vegetable oil are all found to be incredibly toxic oils. All of these uh, polyunsaturated fats, hydrogenated oils that come off the backs of these things, they're inflammation-inducing, they're fattening, they're cancer-causing. We know this by now. These oils you are used in many of the modern foods that you and I eat. And the, the, the point is to using these oils is really to ease production, um, to induce cravings so you buy more, and to make the products really cheap. And and here's a a fun fact for you in case that's not enough for you not to eat these. Soybean oil and canola oil often go bad during the processing of the food. What do I mean by that? They go rancid. So the food is no longer uh, good. It's bad for you, but it, it it often stinks. And so what the companies do is they use chemicals and bleach even to kill the odor so you can't tell that the oil you're eating is bad is has gone bad. Yum. Delicious. I'm going to go vegan. I'm going to get rid of meat. I'm going to get rid of milk. And I'm going to get rid of butter. I'm going to go vegan. Here's a delicious bar, a granola bar made with canola and soybean oil. Guess what? That oil was produced years ago and it's been sitting in a vat and it's gone rancid so they bleached it so you can't tell delicious this is why i have a principle to ignore and to avoid many franken foods and eat food as close to the way god made it as possible look for grass-fed meat go for wild caught fish caught out of waters that are not destroyed like the atlantic ocean find wild alaskan sockeye salmon if you can because those waters are less tainted by mankind. Organic vegetables, preferably preferably bought at a farmer's market by local farmers because it's cheaper and because you support small business, but also because you're getting high quality stuff because these people care about what they're putting in your body. And eat good pasture-raised eggs. Um, pasture-raised eggs uh, get, you know, if, in case you care, you're listening to the podcast. It's my podcast, I'll tell you. Pasture-raised eggs are different than organic eggs. They're different than um, omega-3 infused eggs. They're different than cage-free eggs or, you know, whatever other marketing thing they do. All of these types of eggs you're buying are all, um, they're all marketing ploys. So if you buy an organic egg, let's say, organic egg may be organic because it's fed organic feed. So it doesn't mean it's, uh, it doesn't mean it's eating its normal natural habitat of food. Um, it's just being fed organic feed. So uh, an organic egg is the result of a chicken that's being fe- fed organic corn and organic grain. Uh, a cage-free egg, essentially, what that means is that the egg, the, the chicken rather, is not kept um, in a, an enclosed box like those like crappy white eggs that you buy from the store. Those crappy low-budget white eggs you might get from Walmart that are like 99 cents for a 12-pack. Those chickens are basically tortured in cages and have no space to move. Chickens often die in those enclosures and the other chickens just live around them and they're sort of fed GMO grain and corn. Um, A cage-free egg basically has a similar environment, but there's a door. So that's the only difference. And so the door, it can often be this big, it's tiny, and you don't and the chickens may not have even live to see that said door. So that's all you, that's all that cage free means is that technically they can get out, right? That's all it means. It means that if there was a prison of 40,000 people uh, and they, they had an enclosure of, let's say, 10,000 square feet, there was technically a small window that they could get out of if they could get to it. That's all it means. It's it's marketing. Pasture-raised chickens, pasture-raised eggs. Oh, wait, omega-3 eggs, my favorite. This is basically eggs or chickens that are fed uh, a, an additional omega-3 supplement when they're being produced and they're producing eggs, or even the eggs are infused themselves uh, or um, fortified with omega-3 themselves. Um, also sort of a weird science experiment. Um, technically you're getting some omega-3. Sometimes it's not even bioavailable, meaning that you can't digest it regardless. Pasture-raised eggs um, are come from a chicken that has a, legally 108 square feet of, 
of their own space on a pasture. That's what it means. And they eat and uh, they eat whatever they so choose. So that typically means things like grass. Um, and it also means things like grubs in the yard that they may find, which is a thing a chicken would normally eat. Sometimes they even eat field mice. They'll catch a mouse. If you find a vegetarian fed egg from Trader Joe's or whatever store that tries to market to you, just know they're trying to trick you. Why? Because chickens are not vegetarians, guys. They're not vegetarians. They don't, they're not raised on grain and corn, which is basically when they say it's vegetarian fed. They're trying to trick the, the stay-at-home mom or the you know 60-year-old dad who's just trying to buy something healthy for their family. And he goes in and goes, oh, this says vegetarian fed. That's probably a healthy thing. Well, all it means is that they fed them grain and corn exclusively. So they were not, they didn't have access to the worms that they might or the bugs they might eat or even like the field mice or other little critters they might get a hold of, which is something that they would typically eat. <clears throat> Um, that's your eggs, okay? You have to be very careful. The point is, eating food as close to the way God created it as possible allows us to get a wide spectrum of nutrient, micronutrient, vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and sugars um, that is naturally produced in nature and is most healthy for us. Okay, that's number one. Let's move on. Number two, think quality food over quantity food. Modern com common knowledge tells us to think about quantity of food before all. But as the saying goes, much of common knowledge is merely a reflection of social bias. Okay? Large companies like McDonald's and Coca-Cola encourage you to count your calories. Coca-Cola will place calorie numbers on their cans to convince you that they are healthy or at least within a well-balanced diet. This Coca-Cola is only 100 calories, which means you can subtract that from your daily 2,000 to 3,000 calorie budget. It's total garbage. McDonald's drive through you'll see a bunch of calorie listings next to each menu item. I hate to break it to you guys. I hate to break it to you. I hate to break it to McDonald's or anyone. But human beings are not mere machines consuming calories all the same. Do you think someone consuming McDonald's meals with the same macronutrient breakdown as chicken and rice do you think that that person would perform exactly the same on both things? Of course not. Human beings require quality foods, not just quantity, because there's more at play biomechanically than just, uh, and, by, and hormonally than just calories in and calories out. There's a great book by Gary Topps called Why We Get Fat. This sort of debunks the whole uh, calories in, calories out movement. We're not math equations. Um, there's so much more at play. Friends, things like insulin resistance or leptin resistance, um, or you know, high blood sugar, um, metabolic system. We have metabolism. There's all these other things that are at play, um, and how your food, how your body, like you know, are you burning glucose? Are you in ketosis? Are you going through gluconeogenesis, which is your body converting protein into uh, glucose? Is any of these things happening to you at any given moment? What's your testosterone like? What's your estrogen like? Your body doesn't just metabolize food all the same, no matter who you are. Um, so I would recommend Why We Get Fat by Gary Tobbs to you. There's going to be a link in the show notes for you to um, get this book if you need it. Just understand that, you know, McDonald's, when they put their, you know, calorie count on the Big Mac, their goal is to sort of convince you that, oh, this fits within a certain number of calories. The problem is... Um, you don't perform the same eating 3,000 calories of grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish, pasture-raised eggs, organic vegetables, um, berries, lemon, lime, those sort of things, and sweet potatoes, as you would, say, eating a Big Mac and French fries and Coca-Colas. You don't perform the same. It's total garbage. And, you know, the truth is most people go on a calorie-restricted diet and they have a lot of success right away um, because it's the first time they've ever restricted calories. So they've stopped eating trash as well, and they started eating like watching what they eat. And so they go, well, calories in, calories out must work. Yeah, to a certain degree, it is good to make sure you're, you're eating the right foods. But if you focus on quality first, you're going to have a lot more success. Human beings require quality foods, not just quantity. 
Not shockingly, quality is very much related to eating foods as close to the way God made them as possible, right? This means we should again look for high quality meats, fresh wild caught fish, fresh organic veggies, low sugar fruits. These foods are typically untainted by modern marketing tactics and do not have harmful additives, preservatives, antibiotics, or any other things associated with the food found in most grocery stores and restaurants, okay? So start choosing food based purely on quality for a few weeks and don't count your calories at all. That's my suggestion to you. That's what I do when I coach people is I have them track their food, I have them eat quality food, and then I have them not count calories right away. And soon you're gonna realize you get full on your own and instinctively put your fork down because your body's starting to work better as a result. No additives, no man-made synthetics involved. Number three, watch out for destroyer foods. This is what I call them, destroyer foods. Think of destroyer foods like your kryptonite, right? Like Superman and his kryptonite, if he gets exposed to kryptonite, he gets weaker, he gets worse. Dave Asprey, the bulletproof guy, he talks about kryptonite food. It's a good, it's a good analogy. Um, these are foods that harm you not help you, right? Food, the way God made it, builds you up. These foods, these destroyer foods will make you sick. They'll make you worse. You'll perform worse. You'll age faster. Who wants to age faster? Now, what are some examples of these destroyer foods? Well, we already have covered any and all of the Franken foods, but you know, we'll talk a little bit about, and I call them Franken foods because they are sort of uh, produced in a lab somewhere and they're produced often with marketing and capitalism in mind, right? All, along with lining the pockets of shareholders, that's their ultimate job. Nabisco is not worried about you. They're worried about making money. So when they make you eat Chips Ahoy or Nutter Butters or what, what else do they produce? Do they do Cheez-Its? Um, they do uh, Oreos. They're not worried about your health, okay? They actually could care less about your health. They're only worried about making money, okay? That includes foods like Ritz crackers and the like. Sugar-packed beef jerky is another marketing tactic. Um, Jack Link's beef jerky, nine grams of sugar in, in meat. Don't, don't eat that, right? Gluten in most grains can also be considered destroyer foods. Okay, Grains we eat today have been genetically modified for taste and speed of production and include almost none of the nutritional content that grains used to have. And then they, on the back end, they go ahead and enrich the grains with minerals and vitamins. But again, they're not bioavailable. They're often undigestible by us. So it's sort of a, a mute point anyway, a moot point anyway, to put that stuff back in. So when you eat today's bread, you are not eating something manufactured to be chewy. You're eating something rather to be uh, manufactured to be chewy, to smell good, to taste good. But again, that causes inflammation. It causes brain fog. It causes gut distress. It's not going to serve you in the long term. Keep an eye out uh, in terms of destroyer foods for nutritionally void sauces and creams. They put all over your food at restaurants for taste. If you're walking into an Applebee's or an Outback Steakhouse or a Black Angus, which those aren't great places to eat anyway. But if, and I'm not just talking about quality of taste of food. I'm talking about like in terms of, um, and talking about in terms of nutritional content. Um, they're gonna pump all sorts of and pour all sorts of sauces all over your food. So even if you get something healthy, you're, it's gonna end up bad. This includes things like salad dressings, uh, salad dressings, often filled with high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oil all over them. Uh, these dressings are meant to induce your cravings. By the way, so you order more food. While they taste good, they're often loaded with sugar and give you headaches, raise your blood sugar, and leave you hungry an hour later. That's their goal. Another destroyer food is anything fried. Fried food is most certainly a destroyer food. First, you coat whatever you're frying in flour. Um, and then we have already talked about the danger of gluten and grain. But then you dunk that flour and cover them in vegetable oil or peanut, uh, peanut oil or some other toxic oil. And we've already discussed the toxic and likely rancid nature of these oils. And then that food gets fried at really high temperatures, which denatures the oil, um, oxidizes it. And then the fat um, that, because you, you're putting an egg on, uh, when you deep fry something, you're putting usually putting eggs with it. And if there's a meat, it's usually have some sort of fat in it. All that fat oxidizes, and oxidizing means the fat is damaged by the oxygen. And oxidized fat basically accelerates aging, causes inflammation all throughout the body. Total recipe for disaster, okay? There's one more destroyer food of note, but it's worth giving it its own category. Here's number four in our eight simple health hacks. Eliminate sugar. Guys, sugar is almost in everything we eat. It's every, it's, it is in everything we eat for the most part, especially anything on a standard American diet. 
particularly in the modern West. Um, and you should it should be avoided as much as possible. Okay, sugar or sucrose, it's kind of its legal name, and its cousin fructose, which comes from a lot of fruit. Most of those things should be limited as much as possible as they cause chronic inflammation in the body. Um, we know that chronic inflammation, again, is the precursor to every all these major diseases we've talked about, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, Alzheimer's, dementia, and even many autoimmune conditions, things like Hashimoto's, all these things. Now, while sugar tastes good, it should be reserved for special occasions, okay? Sugar isn't meant to go in your coffee, um, and then in your mid-morning granola bar at work, and then in the soda or juice you have with your lunch, and then in the salad dressing that you pour on your salad at lunch, um, and then it, after your uh, dinner, you eat dessert, and then it's in your dessert. That's everything, not to mention fruits that are also packed with fructose. Guys, here's the key. Here's what I think will be the key for you. Try to limit your sugar to less than 30 grams a day total. That's not a lot, but it gives you a little wiggle room to have a few grams and drink or some fruit or something like that um, to keep your blood sugar rather stable. If you have high blood sugar, chronically high blood sugar, diabetes, um, if you have you know uh, insulin resistance, something like this, which most people do probably in America, um, you should probably eliminate sugar. The reason you probably have those things in the first place is because you haven't limited sugar. Also, be careful for fake sugars like asulfame, sucralose, and aspartame. These fake sugars are known to cause cancer, despite what your TikTok influencers who are paid to say otherwise tell you. I've said that in many different other podcasts. Um, they still, by the way, induce sugar cravings and sometimes even do still spike your blood glucose. So they act like sugar. They talk They talk like sugar. By golly, it's sugar And at the end of the day, but it causes cancer at higher levels. It's even worse. Number five. Eight simple health hacks. Increase your non-exercise physical activity. My wife hates this, but I call it NEPA. She can't stand this acronym because it's so dorky, but hey, got to get your NEPA in. Am I right? NEPA is defined as any physical activity that's not technically exercise. So if you're moving and you're not working out, that's NEPA. Why do you need NEPA? You might say to my wife's, much to my wife's shame and chagrin. Modern, the modern world is one that is done primarily in front of a screen. You're in front of a screen right now, probably, or you have a screen listening to this, like a phone that you probably use a lot, or maybe even a laptop that you're watching this on YouTube or something like that. You and I, we sit at work, we sit during our commutes, and then to relax, we sit some more, likely in front of a TV or an iPad. It's safe to say that we don't move the way we used to as a society and modern technology like our phones is only making this worse, guys. So to combat this, we need to build in regular rhythms of moving, walking, climbing, jogging outside of our normal exercise. So how to do this? Go for a walk each morning. Start your day off with sunlight and walking. It's an easy solution. If you work out in the morning, that's great. Maybe some people work out in the afternoon and the evening. It, wherever you don't work out, plan a walk for that time. So for me, I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. You don't have to do that, by the way. I'm not one of those guys that's like, I get up at 4.42 every day. I meditate for 10, day, 10 hours. And then I, uh, uh, then I kiss my child on the forehead. And then I build a business and buy 10 rental houses. And then I go have breakfast. That is, you know, one, gra one piece of grass-fed steak, blah, 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 blah. I'm not one of those people. I like to wake up at 5 a.m. because I'm a morning person. So I would get up at five and I work out. I always go for an afternoon walk, whether that's around lunchtime, 12, 31, one, two o'clock, or after work around five. I love getting out walk in. So build reg regular rhythms in moving, walking, climbing, jogging. Go for a walk each morning. Um, carry your luggage at the airport instead of rolling it. Really easy solution for NEPA. Take the stairs when there is an elevator present, unless you're going up 10, 20 flights. Take the stairs. It's it's a simple way to get some NEPA in. Um, park far away from the store instead of fighting for the closest spot next to the Target or the Walmart. Uh, you could even consider biking or walking to work. These are easy forms of NEPA or even getting a treadmill walking desk as a next level hack. Keep in mind, increasing NEPA can surprisingly difficult be surprisingly difficult if you aren't mindful about it. Honestly. Like we sit so much as a society that we can forget about this altogether. 
Also, things like escalators and elevators and moving walkways are designed for our convenience. They keep us from exerting ourselves. Careful of golf cart shuttles at hotels and even valets that will take your bag for you. Politely declining those services will keep you healthy and active all day long. Why would you let your bone structure deteriorate? Um, one of the main one of the main precursors to a long life is muscle mass. Reducing muscle mass is an easy way to die early. One of the ways you do that is by letting all these modern conveniences do everything for you. You don't walk anywhere. You get on golf carts. You don't carry your own bags. You uh, roll your luggage at the airport. Just opt not to. And by the way, you're sitting on an airplane. You might as well just have, you're going to be sitting there forever. You're not going to be able to do anything. You might as well carry your luggage and walk around until your flight comes. Don't, don't. Please avoid, I shouldn't say don't, please avoid rolling your luggage to a seat right next to your gate and sitting there for an hour and then getting on a plane and sitting more. Walk the entire time you're at the airport. That way when you sit in your seat, eh, you got nowhere to go anyway and you got a little nap in, okay? Number six of the eight health hacks. Hack your sleep. This warrants its own podcast and uh, I've done that podcast. You can go back and listen to that. But hack your sleep. <clears throat> Keep in mind, you can do everything right that we've talked about. But if you don't sleep well, you're not going to perform and you're not going to increase your longevity. So you and I, we spend nearly one third of our lives in bed. So dealing, so dialing in uh, your sleep will be paramount to a long and healthy life. Okay, We want you to do this. For those of you that are Christian, when Jesus walked the earth, there weren't many natural barriers to sleeping that you and I have today. Okay. Today, we have light bulbs keep us awake longer than our natural rhythms might desire, leading to sleep deprivation, um, anxiety, insomnia. And you know, maybe you're thinking, you think light bulbs are bad? This, guy, this guy's nuts. That's crazy. Light bulbs aren't bad. No, no, no. Light bulbs are fine. They're a tremendous invention. We're glad we have them, right? But neglecting the consequences of technology on our organic bodies would be silly. According to the American Sleep Association, guys, 50 to 70 million Americans in the United States have a sleeping disorder. Poor sleep and anxiety and depression are all also linked. So it's no wonder why all of these illnesses are going up in conjunction with one another. <clears throat> so what can we do? Here are a few tips. Number one, be mindful of the distracting technology around you. I like to call these things Trojan horses because they seem like a gift, but once they get inside your walls, they harm you. Things like cell phones, iPads, TVs, computers, they're all Trojan horses. They're all bent on destroying your sleep. And when you get exposed to the blue light from those devices, um, they're going to reset your circadian rhythm, signaling your body it's daylight, thus keeping you falling asleep from falling asleep. Okay, It makes very simple. In order to cut this, you're going to have to hack your blue light. You're going to have to get rid of it. First thing you could do, turn off all screens at sundown. If you're not willing to do that, especially if you live in Seattle like I do because it gets dark so early, um, try grabbing some blue, blue blocking glasses. I love True Dark's glasses. Um, I'm going to throw that link for you in the show notes. I have other vi YouTube videos on these. Um, they are fantastic. They block out 99% of blue light. I wear the red ones around an hour to two hours before I go to bed. Um, and that helps me fall asleep. I get tired watching TV or tired um, turning on the uh, tired uh, playing on your phone or talking to your wife or whatever it is, talking to your husband. I get tired talking to my wife because I'm wearing my glasses and the light, even though the light's on, I'm just falling asleep. Um, this is a great way to hack it. Okay. Cut the blue light. Number two, hack block out all the light in your bedroom. Guys, I want you, I want people when they come to your house to think that they're living with a serial killer. Okay, not because you actually are one, but because your your room looks so weird. Blue blackout curtains, black tape over any little blinking lights. Um, if you have an alarm clock or smoke detector that elicits light, put some electrical tape electrical tape over that. The key is to not to be able to see your hand in front of you when you lay in bed. You should be like this, going, I can't see anything. Perfect. When Jesus passed out in the first century, when Paul or Peter passed out in the first century, guess what? They couldn't see a thing because it was dark. We don't have that anymore. We have street lights coming through our windows. We have cars driving past, honking horns. You know, we have the glowing light of the gas station down the street. 
we have the all of the the electric pollution, the light pollution that's pouring through our windows. I don't want any of that for you, okay? And the key is not to be able to see your hand in front of you when you lay down. And by the way, your skin can absorb light too. By the way, your your skin's an organ, so it it's affected by stuff. Your skin can absorb light, so a sleep mask will help, but it's not going to solve the problem. You really do need to block out all the light. Uh, blackout curtains, I even do, has gone as far to put foil over windows or they make special blue blocking um, or bl uh, blackout rather uh, curtains that sort of stick to your windows. We want it to be dark in your room, okay? Number three, sleep hack, put your devices on airplane mode and kill your Wi-Fi at night. So EMFs or electromagnetic fields, these things are emitted from transmitting devices and will disrupt your sleep. That's just gonna happen. Um, your body is capable of handling a certain degree of EMFs, but if you have your phone transmitting, your Wi-Fi, your neighbor's Wi-Fi, your spouse's phone, not to mention all of the environmental EMFs, you're overdosing. And this is gonna cause massive damage to your cells, another podcast, but it also disrupts your sleep, okay? so. Try to limit it as much as you can. So putting your phone on airplane mode and plugging, unplugging your Wi-Fi eliminates two of the largest EMF emitters at night. You can even purchase EMF filters. I have a couple of these and, and they, I, they plug into your walls and they'll suck up some of those EMFs as well, okay? All right, number seven, eight health hacks. Deal with stress before it deals with you. Now, I'll just say this one quick, but... What is one thing that everyone has that nobody wants? Stress, okay? It's stress. Stress doesn't just make us unproductive and ruin, it also ruins our day. There are serious physical effects to stress. Stress causes things like muscle tension. I can feel it right now in my back from all the stress, right? I got four kids, a wife, job, I'm a pastor, doing this podcast, Love doing all those things, love having all those things, but they still cause stress. Even good stress is oftentimes hard on your body. So muscle tension, things like common ailments, low back pain, neck pain, headaches, chronic stress in your body all the time, not just acute stress for like one day or something like that, but chronic stress can trigger inflammation and that causes breathing problems in some people. So you don't actually breathe properly. You might become a mouth breather or you breathe from your chest which throws off your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, messes you up. Um, individuals with chronic stress also live with elevated heart rate, constricted blood circulation. Um, stress also causes your HPA access to malfunction. Um, that's the system responsible, by the way, for regulating your hormones. Um, and this will um, cause us to be less resilient to stress, lower our immune system, system wreck our hormone profile, um, and make us even susceptible to, to getting sick. Uh, we should do immunity podcast soon. I think that's actually a good good idea. I think we'd all agree that we'd be better off uh, without chronic stress. So how can we help reduce it? Here are a few quick tips. Number one, limit the Trojan horse in your pocket. Uh, again, Trojan horse because it seems like a gift, but it often turns on you. Um, that's your phone. Along with social media and your email apps, um, those things have been designed to create an addiction so you will check it more often. Um, I used to live in, I'm from the Bay Area. I lived in Silicon Valley. I was a pastor in San Francisco. We had people at our church uh, that worked at Google and Facebook um, and they worked on the addictive mechanics of the phone and, and, their, and on their apps. Their job was to get you to be addicted. Google and Facebook even hired the same people that help engineer addictive slot machines in Vegas to keep you addicted and dependent on your products. So the constant dings, the constant buzzes from your phone, those things heighten your stress and increase cortisol, which is you know your stress hormone. And that's gonna keep you in fight or flight mode and keep you stressed out. So <clears throat> what can you do? Use screen time to uh, protect yourself from your phone. Uh, easy thing if you have an iPhone. Uh, Google has, uh, Androids rather, have their, have their uh, software for that as well. You can also download other apps on Android that do this for you. Limit social media access to 30 minutes a day if you can on your screen time. I think that's like as about as much as anyone should digest of that anyway. I'm guilty of going over that, but screen time helps me regulate it. Give a trusted friend or family member your screen time passcode so you don't have access to it. That's what I've done. My wife has my screen time code. My apps kill at 8.30. 
I can't open them. It's fantastic, right? No stressful emails will be popping up in my inbox because screen time has locked it. And if screen time is not an option for you that you want to use, consider just deleting all the apps on your phone altogether um, and blocking them and also just accessing social media over a desktop alone. That alone is a small hack. If you're saying, I have no social media on my phone, I only use it on my computer, that'll keep you from using it as much. The second tip for de-stressing is getting solitude. This is a spiritual practice. This is a, a spiritual formation practice that Jesus practiced, right? One of the things you can do is each month schedule a day or half a day without any devices. Where you go to the beach, you get into the nature, you go to the mountains, you hike all by yourself. Um, and this bout of solitude allows you to be alone with God and frees you up to create moments with Jesus and be creative in your journal and to think of new ideas. Maybe start a business, maybe work on your family, whatever it is. It must have been a way Jesus was able to de-stress because Jesus, you know, Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Uh, he also is the sympathetic high priest. Um, he is, he was, he did everything that we, he got all the temptations we had, but he overcame them. And one of the things that you and I are susceptible to is stress and how stress could cause us to be angry, frustrated, anger, lash out, but also detach, medicate, become addicted to something we shouldn't be. Jesus overcame. And I bet he used solitude a lot in order to get away with God, pray to the God, the father, and it had to be a way he de-stressed from the anxieties of being harassed by naysayers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, but also the thousands of people that would flock to him must have been at some point overwhelming. And that's why he retreated so much. Even after he fed the 5,000, by the way, he fed the 5,000 uh, fish and, and, and loaves, but that was just 5,000 men. So there were likely women there too and children. So there was probably upwards of 10 plus thousand people there. He eventually bailed on that, right? And he went up to the mountains to be alone and pray. And that's when he walked on water. So I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, but that's what happens to Jesus when he gets up, gets some time alone. <clears throat> Number three, use med meditation app to hack your stress. This is good for me. I love this. Your, uh, use your phone against itself by using an app like Calm or Abide, which is a Christian meditation app to perform guided and unguided meditations. Again, um, if you don't like Calm, I love Calm, but Abide is a fully Christian alternative to Calm, and although Calm has plenty of non-spiritual content to help you de-stress, um, some people just want to hear more prayerful meditation. There's also a Pray As You Go, which is a sort of a, a Catholic version, and you know it can get a little wonky if you're not Catholic uh, with some of the some of the extra books of the Bible, First and Second Maccabees, and all that stuff. So if you just want to avoid that, but I, I use all three in varying capacities. Honestly, spending five or 10 minutes or even 20 minutes a day meditating will do wonders for your mindfulness and help you reduce stress. You'll be more, west, more, more aware when you're stressing out and you'll be able to calm yourself more instinctively because you'll have the tools to do it, okay? Okay, there's one more uh, stress tip that I'll share with you here, but again, it's such a fantastic tip that it deserves its own section, okay? Don't be afraid of natural supplements to hack your health. Don't be afraid, okay? I take a ton of supplements every morning. Now, I'm not going to GNC and eating a bunch of trash supplements, but I, I, do, I do use a lot of supplements. Many people have an innate fear of supplements when it comes to, especially because it comes to the word supplement and it conjures up images of like Arnold Schwarzenegger um, or other bodybuilders or other meatheads. And you're like, I don't want to be that massive or something like that. But in the, in the words of Arnold, he would say, don't worry, you never will. You're never going to get big like Arnold Schwarzenegger, even if you, you're not going to accidentally fall into looking that big, okay? It's never going to happen. But that's not the point. You don't want to be that big. Great. There are many supplements that we should be taking advantage of that can help us fill in the gaps of our nutrition because we're going to have them and take an area of our performance to the next level if we want that, right? So let me give you a few supplements that you should consider taking today. But of course, I'm not a doctor, so please consult with your doctor or your physician if you decide to take anything that you have not taken before. Talk to a professional. I'm not a doctor, I just play one on YouTube. <clears throat> First, as it relates to stress, like we talked about, an underrated supplement is adaptogenic herbs. Adaptogenic herbs, um, get, they, get them names because they get their names because they help humans adapt 
quote unquote, to their environments. They grow in different regions of the world. And when we take them, it helps humanity adapt to that specific region. And my favorite adaptogenic herbs are things like ashwagandha, rhodiola rose, and licorice root extract. These are three. There are some uh, supplement uh, stacks that come together pre-made. Things like Calm Now. Um, there are some great other ones out there. Serotonin Brain Food, which is another great one by Natural Stacks. There are lots of other ones. These are great. Um, and again, don't take them without talking to someone that's a professional. But I do recommend some of these things once you do. Ashwagandha, rhodiola, rosé, licorice root. These three herbs help all humans adapt to stress by reducing cortisol, curbing anxiety, two things we both need. And by the way, there's no need to take a hardcore prescription jug just yet. Try God's natural herbs first before jumping to something pharmaceutical. Adaptogenic herbs not only help us with stress and anxiety, but things like maca. I love maca. It's another great herb that increases libido for some people. I've, I've recommended that in coaching before. Again, don't take anything that you're not willing to talk to your doctor about first. But it helps regulate a, a woman's cycle. Things like ginseng, uh, not just known for being in monster energy drinks. It's also a well-known adaptogenic herb that improves your mood and improves immune function. And even reishi contains antioxidants that help you detox from environmental toxins that are out there. The second supplement nearly everybody should take is vitamin D. Okay, Vitamin D, uh, I'll just say 75% of Americans walking around are deficient in vitamin D. It is virtually impossible to get enough in your regular diet. And so while the sun does produce vitamin D a lot, and so a lot of people that grew up in warm climates, Arizona, Florida, uh, the South, uh, Texas, uh, Southern California, even most of Central and Northern California, you probably get enough vitamin D, but a lot of people don't. And while the sun does produce some, our computer-based culture has us indoors most of the day and high doses of vitamin D are required. Things like 5,000 IUs, I think, are most often recommended by functional medicine doctors. You could start there. Vitamin D, though, improves many things, including bone health and heart health and even your mood. You need to have it. People have vitamin D lights. Um, I have this guy here. This is a, uh, a vitamin D, like a, they call them happy lights, but here in Seattle, I have one of those. Those things are great too. But again, pairing vitamin D uh, with a vitamin A and K2 supplement in an ADK supplement stack is a great option. Okay, I think that's actually what I would recommend as an ADK supplement. Um, I'm gonna, by the way, throw a lot of these um, supplement suggestions in the show notes. So if you wanna take a look on Amazon or something, I'm going to go ahead and send you, I'm going to link uh, some of my favorites in the show notes on YouTube, on the website, and hopefully in the show notes of the podcast, okay? Lastly, don't forget to consider the supplementing with magnesium. Magnesium is a micronutrient that does so many different things in your body. You absolutely need this. A lot of people are magne magnesium deficient. That's terrible, a uh, terrible reality. You need magnesium. It can improve your sleep health. I can decrease muscle soreness. It helps you relax. It even increases brain function. Of course, what magnesium does for you depends on which type of magnesium you take. Do not take magnesium oxide. It's basically junk. And if you go to Walgreens to buy a supplement, that's going to be what's in it. It's total junk. I believe the two best forms of magnesium are magnesium citrate and magnesium glycinate. Both of these forms help you relax and help your sleep especially when taken towards the latter part of the day. Guys, can you believe it? It's only been 50 minutes or so, and we got through the eight health hacks that are going to help jumpstart your health and wellness journey. The three pillars of well-being for X and Hilo, longevity, and performance will improve if you do these eight things, okay? If this show was helpful for you, I would ask you, please, recommend this channel to, uh, if you're on YouTube, to a friend, send them the link to this podcast. If you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, send this to a friend and also subscribe, follow, like, do all of the things because this helps our channel grow because there is not a lot of conversation on biblically based wellness principles and I want people to begin to connect faith and health together because they should be. Also, pretty soon here, I'm gonna be launching out my coaching business more broadly. 
Uh, I do some uh, behind the scenes coaching uh, with people on health and wellness. And I would love to offer that and extend it more broadly because the podcast is honestly, um, it's actually picking up and people are asking for it. And so something I've done just more privately and more one-off, I think I'm going to be launching here pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that as well. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you on the next one. One more thing. The statements in this video or audio have not been evaluated by the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Information provided here is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The information provided by this website and or by this podcast is not a substitute for a physician visit and should not be taken as medical advice of any sort or kind. This is a list of resources for further self-research and work with your personal physician if needed. By using any of this information, by watching, listening, or reading it, you are accepting responsibility for your own health and health decisions and expressly release this podcast, its participants, and its websites from any and all liability whatsoever, including that which might come from negligence. Also, don't smoke cigarettes, don't do drugs, stay in school, don't touch hot surfaces, and please wear your safety glasses when cutting wood.